You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weeks, but today we have a special guest upgrader. It's Jamie Block. Hello. Great to see you, everyone. Great to be doing a podcast with you, Rachel. (laughs) Thank you. I thank you for joining us, taking the time. It's always nice when other people do the upgrades on these, so it's not not all me all the time. Uh, And this is a very cool precon that we were talking about today. Today, we're upgrading the Food and Fellowship Abzan, halfling, and food halfling, deck. Halfling, food, life gain, Tokens. little creatures, go wide, maybe. Yeah, there's a lot going on. All cool things. Um, You've but got options. Yeah, that's... Uh, it's it's kind of fun that they gave you a, a few different directions that you could take this deck if you want to go in an upgrading direction. Uh, we have got the stats. We're breaking down the deck. We're talking about what is in the deck financially and mechanically, and we will break that down. But first, we're going to talk about a lot of cards today. You can pick up all of those as sealed product or singles at cardkingdom.com slash command. We know you're buying magic cards. Please spend it with Card Kingdom and support the show while you're doing it. They've got a great selection of sealed product and singles. Uh, There's a ton of different versions of cards. There's tons of cards coming out in Lord of the Rings. Make sure that you're ordering all of the exact printings you want because you've got options baby uh and card kingdom has the inventory to support that so make sure that you are supporting the show while you shop for magic cards at cardkingdom.com slash command you can also support the show by going to ultrapro.com slash command to pick up all of the magic accessories you need in your life i'm talking about play mats and deck boxes and dice and sleeves uh they've got an amazing selection of magic products with the official licensed art so i'm hoping that there's gonna be some really cool stuff for lord of the rings keep an eye out on the ultra pro website uh also you can sign up for their newsletter which will keep you up to date on whenever they drop new products or they have a new crazy deal uh or when they have a like a secret layer play mat where they take the art from secret layer products and put them on play mats and they usually go fast so make sure you're paying attention to ultrapro.com slash command to support the show and get some cool stuff uh, the final way to support us is directly on patreon.com slash command zone. Uh, our patrons are the lifeblood of this show. You help pay us. You help make this show happen uh, and make sure that we are bringing you all of the magic content that you want. So thank you so much if you are a patron or uh, thinking about becoming a patron. You should do it because there's some cool perks. You get to see extra turns and game nights early. You get access to exclusive content like turn talks, uh, which is a ton of fun. You watch the players talk about the game they just had and be like okay this is what was in my hand if i had one more draw step i could have done it uh i love extra turns i hope our patrons do too so uh join our patreon support the show get some cool stuff and we shout out one lucky patreon patron every episode and this episode is dedicated to luke Luke Diabo. diabo thanks luke you rock you rock we've done it Let's get into it. Um, (laughs) Our main topic today is we are talking about the food and fellowship precon. This is a white, black, and green precon. We are going to talk about it. We're going to upgrade it. We're going to talk about the stats in this box. Uh, But first, let's just talk about this deck. So what is it? It's halflings, it's food, it's whatever you want it to be, kind Mm -hmm. of. Uh, As always, there's a few different commander options that you can choose from out of the gate. Uh, And they really can pull you in different directions. And I think they did a good job at making it so that even out of the box, whichever one you choose is going to have at least a decent amount of support. Some definitely better than others. Mm -hmm. But whether you want it to be a go-wide tokens deck, whether you want it to be a life gain deck, Mm -hmm. whether you want to sort of do some shenanigans with unblockable little guys in the ring, (laughs) uh, the deck can make that work for you. Sure. Uh, so the face commander of commanders, actually, of this precon are partners. Do you want to introduce us? Yes. Uh, up first, we have the one and only, or I should say the two and only, <laughs> Frodo and Sam. So first, we have Frodo, Adventurous Hobbit. Uh, it costs two mana, one white and one black. Uh, he has partner with Sam. Uh, he's a 1-3 with Vigilance, a legendary halfling scout that says whenever he attacks, if you gained three or more life this turn, the ring tempts you. 
Then, if Frodo is your ring bearer, and the ring has tempted you two or more times this game, draw a card, and we will explain what the ring is after I read what Sam does. Sam uh, costs three mana, one green-white, uh, and he says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a food token. But also, activated abilities of foods you control cost one less to activate. Uh, he is a 2-4, while Frodo is a 1-3. Okay. Uh, the ring. Yeah, let's talk about it. Um, this is a new mechanic. The ring tempts you, uh, and you're going to need the ring token to explain what it does. It's kind of dungeony in that way. So the ring says... The first level is your ring bearer is legendary and can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. So the first time the ring tempts you, you select a creature and then it becomes legendary and gains this first ability. Right, which is very good with uh, Frodo's whole thing is it wants to attack and right. it does not want to die in combat despite being small. So the first mode automatically makes it difficult to block. So good yeah. synergy there. Helpful. The second mode is whenever your ring bearer attacks, draw a card, then discard a card. Nice little looting effect. Neat. The third effect is whenever the ring bearer becomes blocked by a creature, that creature's controller sacrifices it at the end of combat. So it's still, it has to, first of all, <laughs> it's it can't already, have greater power. It's already hard to block. Right. But it, like in the Frodo example, it right. punishes the opponent. If they triple blocked it with three one ones, yeah. they are losing all of them right. in the trade. Even though Frodo could only technically kill one of them, because they can block Frodo, they will still get to get destroyed. Uh, the next mode is whenever your ring bearer deals combat damage to a player, each opponent loses three life. Okay. So the way that actually works, the way yes. that you get this uh, in the first place, a magic card will tell you the ring tempts you as part of the rules text of what it does. Uh, and basically when that happens, if you have not been tempted at all, you get this lovely ring emblem mm -hmm. uh, and it starts with the first ability and you choose a creature to be your ring bearer uh, and sort of put it on it. Mm -hmm. uh, then each time after that, you both A, have the option to keep it where it is or reassign it yep. and B, it gains one more ability and it's cumulative. It never loses an ability once it has it uh, so then once you've been tempted at least four times, the ring has all the abilities it's going to get. Mm -hmm. And every time you get tempted uh, after that, you can move it around, but it's maxed out ability-wise. So if you move the ring bearer, you move all of the abilities to the new ring bearer. There's exactly. one ring bearer and one stack of ring abilities. Yes. There's no reset on the ring when you move it. Uh, yep. The ring gains its abilities and keeps them. Even if you don't have a creature and the ring tempts you, it still gains an ability if it's not maxed out. Yeah. And then you would have to, like, if you don't control any creatures, you would have to get tempted again to put it on a new person. Exactly. Yeah, cool. So that's the ring. Get yourself one of these. It's perforated. I don't really understand why. Uh, <laughs> like, you can bend it. There's, like, a seam in it. I, yeah. I'm sure there's a very smart way to use that. <laughs> I'm sure it's to make it take up less space when you put it underneath um, your ring bearer. But another way to do that is to overlap the card. Just just stack them up. We do it a lot. Um, so, you know, use that to, to your liking. Uh, okay, so Sam makes food and gains life, which helps make Frodo better. Yeah, uh, Sam makes it easy to hit that three life right. threshold. And also there's a lot of food synergy in the deck. So Sam, just a guaranteed food every turn, can mm -hmm. put in work in the rest of the deck. Uh, and then Frodo uh, eventually becomes draw a card every turn, in yep. theory, assuming that you have good attacks because the ring is on it, making it harder to block. Right. It would be like at some point it would be draw two cards, discard one because he gains the ability of the ring. So, right. yeah, uh, Frodo will only allow you to tempt the ring once a turn, once on your turn, uh, because it, you ha he has to attack to trigger it. So, And you have to have gained at least three life, yeah. which even with the cost reduction, there is some mana that has to go into doing that every turn, at least right. if you're just looking at the commanders. Right. So it's a little bit of life gain. It's a little bit of, like, attacking. Like, this is Frodo's sort of Voltron-y in a strange way. Uh, yeah. but, but more life gain focused. It feels like life gain mixed with sort of fair incremental card advantage to keep your plan going. Right. But no, nothing bombastic out of the command zone. Right. Okay. Um, the next 
uh, set of commanders that you could make the commander of this deck is Mary, Warden of Isengard, and Pippin, Warden of Isengard. So uh, again, another partner pairing. Mary is a halfling advisor for one, a green, and a white. He is partner with Pippin. And it says, whenever one or more artifacts enter the battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 white soldier creature token with lifelink. This ability triggers only once each turn. So anytime a food would enter, you also make a soldier. Uh, let's see what Pippin does. Does he make a food? Sure does. Pippin, Warden of Isengard, is black and a green for a halfling advisor. He's a 2-2 with partner with Mary, and he has a, two activated abilities. The first one is one in tap, create a food token. The second is tap and sacrifice four foods. Other creatures you control get plus three, plus three, and gain haste until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. Okay. So Pippin makes foods, which makes soldiers, which Pippin then buffs. Yeah, they work together intuitively. Not that Frodo and Sam don't. Yeah. But uh, they work together in a bit more of a board building, right? win-con having fashion, perhaps, than Frodo and Sam do. Right. This is a little less life gainy and a little bit more tokeny. Yeah, there's a good chance that you are almost never sacrificing a food to gain life. Right. In a build based around them. Mm-hmm. Uh, You're just saving because, them for that Yeah, overrun. you want to save them up. Yeah. Uh, saving them for that overrun and, you know, you're activating Pippin as much as possible to just make more foods so you can get an overrun faster. Cool. Okay. There is, weirdly, a third option that you could make the commander of this deck. Uh, and it's Bilbo birthday celebrant. He's the birthday boy. He's having a good time. <laughs> uh, he costs Abzan, so three total. Uh, he is a halfling rogue. Uh, a 2-3 that says if you would gain life, you gain that much life plus one instead, and you can pay five mana to an Abzan, tap him, and exile him to search your library for any number of creature cards, put them onto the battlefield, oh, then God. shuffle. That sounds great. Activate only if you have 111, or I should say 111. 111. Or more life. <laughs> I'm glad they at least made it or more instead of exactly. Yeah, my God. <laughs> what a headache. Especially because he makes, whenever you gain one life, you gain two life. It would be hard to add an odd yeah, number. Yeah, it would be very hard to add <laughs> an, an odd number. <laughs> okay, so Bilbo is clearly fully life gain. We're not messing with the ring. We're not messing even with food tokens. We're just trying to gain as much life as possible to maybe activate this completely terrifying activated ability. Yeah, I don't think the uh, terrifying activated ability necessarily... You know what? It does. It does win you the game yeah. the turn you activate it, <laughs> even in the deck out of the box. But boy, should it win you the game in any deck that you build from scratch around Bilbo. Yeah, I... It, I think it's tough in a pre-con setting to get to 111 life, even when you're gaining one more each time there is a lot of life gain in this deck but it that's a lot <laughs> yeah let's say food sack for four yeah that's 20 foods <laughs> that's too many foods <laughs> if you've made 20 foods over the course of the game the game's been going on long enough that someone should have won another way yeah that you you shouldn't have uh uh <laughs> <laughs> Plus, like, no one should allow you to activate this. It's extremely, e extremely projected and uh, very scary. Yeah, so. I would say it's kill on sight, except you probably have a while. Yeah, it's got a very clear clock, and the clock is 25 minutes or so. You're yeah. got, you can take your time. Okay, so there's, like, three options here. We're going to reserve uh, our opinion for a second, because first I want to look at the stats. Stats. stats we've did it perfect it's done um i want to talk about like what's in the deck before we make a decision on who should go at the helm um and it's a pretty good mix i think a pretty good balance yeah it's pretty solid uh, so how many ramp cards are in the deck up first we have 12 ramp cards nice that's reasonable, especially, mm -hmm. you know, I think some decks uh, maybe run a little more, though that's about right. But this one especially has a pretty low mana curve. A lot mm -hmm. of the halflings cost two or three mana. Oh, yeah. These commanders are low, low CMC. It's like two and three, two and three, and three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If anything, they are competing with ramp for what right. you're doing in the for early sure. game. Uh, up next, we have card draw. Mm -hmm. We have 11 pieces of card draw. That's okay. It's, it's fine. A, a little low. Uh, Pippin and Mary don't have any card draw on them. Frodo does. Uh, 
but uh, yeah, Bilbo does not either. So certainly not. eleven seems a little low, but but fine. Yeah, it's not um, it's not low to the point that it's a problem. It's not a what were they thinking mm-hmm. level of low. It's just sort of on the low end of the acceptable range. Right. Yeah. Uh, then single target interaction. Mm-hmm. We have nine pieces. It's about right for what I would expect out of a precon and what I kind of want. Yeah, I feel like that's my building from scratch target number these days. Right. I whenever these precons have like over ten, uh, usually less than fifteen, but over ten, it always feels like removal's taking up too many slots. So I actually like this number at nine. Yeah. Then for board wipes, we have four, which is. Definitely more Mm -hmm. than I would usually do. I'm definitely at the two board wipe stage. Yeah. However, I kind of think it's good to great in this because at least one is asymmetrical. Right. Uh, The board wipes that mostly blow up big stuff and Mm -hmm. leave your creatures alone uh, can be very good in this deck. So Mm -hmm. sort of if you think about it that way, I that number grows on me when you consider that a couple of these wipes are not going to be taking out your own board and can be used proactively on offense mm. rather than just resetting the game and everyone has to keep right. building from I, scratch. I have really liked that trend in pre-con board wipes that they've included is mostly ones that you can take advantage of. So they feel more like a win con and less like a reset. Yeah. Uh, and then lands, we have 38, which... Perfectly fine number. Yep. Maybe a little high. Uh, normally, if I include 38, I like to have modal spells, but... 38 is a good place to start. Yeah, solid number for a pre-con. Mm-hmm. Those 38 plus the 12 ramp cards, 50, that is sort of generally the amount you want, is half the deck mm-hmm. is mana producing in some way, so right. the other half can do fun stuff. And most of that ramp in this deck, it is green, is land ramp. There's some that isn't, but uh, a lot of them are getting lands out of your deck. Yeah, which is great. Cool. Um, all right, so if we break down the mechanical uh sections of it like not not mechanical the themed sections of the deck uh it gets pretty interesting i mean we've seen a wide range of what this deck can do in the options of the commander um but it it is sort of a widespread here it is so there are a few things to look at and, you know, we're not even necessarily covering all of them because this deck can go in so many directions, but we're covering the main stuff that at least all of the commanders touch on. Yeah. And sort of first and foremost, maybe Bilbo the least, mm. but food. Yes. There are 15 cards that make the food. Yeah. These, they just make food tokens in some way. Great. <laughs> 15 seems about right. Um, especially if you've got something like if you have Sam in the command zone that makes food or you have uh, Pippin that also makes food. Yeah. The deck is going to care about it one way or another. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways is the food payoffs mm-hmm. of which there are 12. Yeah. And these are specifically food payoffs. Yes. So these are like for the number of food that you have or the like every time a uh, food enters, this happens. Yeah. A few things that care just about the fact that you made food this turn yeah. at all, regardless of whether you've sacrificed it or not. Right. It's the presence of food payoffs. Yes. <laughs> uh, along with food, of course, uh, at least Bilbo cares a lot about this one. Mm-hmm. We have just sheer life gain and we have mm-hmm. seven cards that are really in there to gain life. So these cards are, um, just gain life. I didn't include the cards that make food. Obviously, that could be life gain cards, but these are the ones that explicitly only gain life. Uh, it is So it, it doesn't really match up as well with Pippin and Mary, but they do match up well with Sam and Frodo or Bilbo, if you went in that direction. Right. Uh, and then we have life gain payoffs, which again, those are paying off life gain, but also paying off food in theory. Right. Uh, We have 11 of those. Mm -hmm. So taking those with the food payoffs, Mm -hmm. which again, they don't all overlap exactly that way. That's a decent amount of payoffs for whatever strategy you're going for here. Yeah, I think so. And and these payoffs range in terms of like you make more mana or your creatures get bigger. Uh, It could be any number of payoffs. Um, But it's good. It shows a lot of synergy. There's a lot of planning. and the fact that food, you know, is life gain and life gain isn't necessarily food is fighting a little bit, but life gain is life gain and food is life gain. <laughs> yes. And I think they did a good job with uh, 
just making all the food cards and all the life game cards mm-hmm. sort of independently good in a deck that you're building that has nothing to do with this pre-con mm-hmm. that cares about whichever one of those it is. They have yeah. food cards that are good in any food deck, life game cards that are good in any life game deck. Right. So I, I think that's part of why we see the, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe the schism of some playing better with food and others playing better with other kinds of life gain is, yeah. you know, they know that we want to take these decks apart and right. put all the cards in decks of our own brewing. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, and one then, final. Yes. The last uh, deck specific stat that we're talking about, and this is more for the go wide option, is anthems. Mm-hmm. There are five cards in the deck that are pumping the whole team. Pretty good. And it, that's not even including Pippin which is an anthem effect as well. So if you decide to go in a more go wide token direction, there is payoffs there. Yeah. Cool. This makes a lot of sense to me. It shows the diversity of the deck. I think it shows that they're really giving you options here, which is fun. I, when I build decks, I really like stuff that isn't quite as like, if you accomplish this, then you win the game. Mm-hmm. It, it gives you options to figure out what is the best route for this game. If we're going to uh, like, you know what? It looks like we're going wide. So we're going to try and go wide uh, or, you know, choose your own adventure with the different commanders. Speaking of, let's talk about it. So based on those stats and based on what you've seen of the deck, who would you be putting in the command zone to make the deck pilot as best as possible? Uh, my pick is... Mary and Pippin. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that both Mary and Pippin and Frodo and Sam both are sort of doing something gradually and incrementally. Mm-hmm. One is sort of you're gaining a bit of life and you're drawing some cards. The other one is building the board. Mary and Pippin mm-hmm. being the ones that are building the board. Yeah. Um, and I personally just prefer that they are building toward a win con yeah. rather than just drawing you cards in a deck that has a lot of synergies within it. I like that the commanders are the thing that is creating the way in which you are going to win the game. Mm-hmm. So I think that while Frodo and Sam uh, can be a nice little engine together, gaining you life and churning through the deck, they really don't present a win con themselves. Whereas right. Mary and Pippin, if you can go wide with uh, the foods you make, creating the soldiers and other ways to make soldiers and make a big board full of tokens Mm -hmm. and really activate Pippin's second ability to grow the team that can just uh, be a big attack that is worth having access to even if you're uh, just in a way that you wouldn't have access to if they were not in the command zone. Right, for sure. I mean, these two cards really do it all for you where it's like they make food and they make up, they have a payoff for food and they have a payoff for the payoff of food. Mm -hmm. Uh, It it really gives you all of the pieces in the command zone sort of regardless of what you draw. Uh, I agree, very cool. All right, uh, we talked about what is in the box. Let's talk about what's in the box financially. Uh, what, like how, what kind of value you're getting from actually buying this precon? Because your money is hard earned. Why should you spend it on this box of magic cards? Uh, and it's we're going to talk about the reprint value in the deck uh, first. We're going to talk about the overall reprint value in like out of the whole ninety nine. Um, we're only talking about reprints. Of course, we don't know the prices of these new cards. They do not exist yet. Uh, there are fifty five reprints in the deck. So that number is a little bit uh, lower than what we would normally see in a pre-con because they tried to make a lot of mechanically unique and new Lord of the Rings cards. So they're only reprinting 55 cards. That is more reprints than the 40K decks, which there was only like like 25 yeah, or 30 just a handful of, of, of reprints. Um, so they made much more mechanically unique uh Warhammer cards than they did Lord of the Rings cards, which makes sense because they made a whole set of Lord of the Rings cards in addition yes. to these. <laughs> yeah, and you have the 40k element of they they were kind of priced into creature types that right. you could not pull yeah. a creature from existing Magic and just right. have it be in Astartes. So exactly. So this has more reprints than 40k and fewer reprints than normal. It also has a bit of a higher price tag. These decks are going for currently like $55. That could go up, that could go down. We don't know uh, because there's no MSRP. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But uh, currently they're going for $55, which is about $15 more than a precon would normally go. Uh, so I wanted to, so we, we've got the, the total reprint value that we, we can give you in a second. Uh, I, you know what? Let's do it now. Why keep you in suspense? Mm-hmm. The total reprint value of this deck is 
$108.25 out of 55 cards. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That, um, is, that is a number where if we saw it in a pre-con with the standard number of reprints, right. sort of one from another set where there's mm. based, in general 10 new cards and the rest are reprints in the deck. Yeah. Uh, that is a number that we would say is sort of good to great. Yeah. Over like over $100, especially close to 110 is on the great end of things. And these are, it, it's worth noting that like this deck is full of reprints, but all of these arts are unique to this product. So it's, you know, they, there are reprints that we're going to talk about, but we've never seen a card like this before because it's, you know, a, an old favorite, but it has Frodo on it. Yeah. Um, I am in love with the uh, Harmonize. Oh the my Commander God, product. it's so The Hobbits cute. and the Bats singing the Bath song. It's great. So like, yeah. it, it is a Harmonize reprint, but it isn't like, like any Harmonize that we've ever seen before. So I'm really happy with $108 of reprint value, especially dispersed among 55 cards. Um, it's tough to compare because like I said, there's fewer reprints and a higher price tag on the shelf. Uh, but I am, I did pull some numbers for reprint values of previous pre-cons that have had a comparable number of reprints. Mm -hmm. So uh, between 55 and 60 uh, is roughly what I found. So the Commander 2020 uh, Ecoria pre-cons averaged at around $96 for, for about 60 cards. Mm -hmm. The 2021 Strixhaven decks averaged around $88 for about the same number of reprints. The Commander 2021 Forgotten Realms uh, precons averaged about 115, which is great, especially for a $40 deck. They were those were notably high. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty is sort of famously low, uh, is average around $72.89, uh, which is the result of the vehicle precon having a very low refund value. Um, so 108 puts us in the top range of that, um, which is great, but it is, you know, $15 higher box. So I think there's lots of value in this, especially with the, with the unique art, but it is sort of tough to compare at this point. Yeah, you're also getting, uh, and you know, time will tell how the sort of new cards in this deck mm. compare power level wise to just new cards in previous pre-cons, mm. but just the number of them and sort of the fact that they are, you know, definitely uh, trying to make this product really be in high demand. Uh, there just seems to be a lot of cards in here that are going to be desirable and thus high value right. among the new cards. Right. I agree. So who is to say how high the total value will become mm -hmm. once all the new cards are spoiled and priced? Uh, we also ha have to give you a caveat. Of course, the values that we came up with today are the values at time of recording, which is before they are announced. So these prices will go down, but we are comparing this precon at the same time as other precons. So the it makes them comparable. But this value will not hold once the reprints are announced as always happens. Right. All right. Let's get into these notable reprints. Um, we're going to talk about all of the cards more than $2. Uh, we're going to talk about the cards $5 and more and the cards between 2 and $5, uh, of which there are a total of 14. Yeah. We have five that are in the five or more category and then nine that are uh, in the two to five range. And a couple of these are bangers. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about these reprints that are above $5. There's a big one. There's a big one. What's the big one? The first one is a sweet hit. It is Toxic Deluge. Toxic Deluge? They reprinted it in a pre-con. <laughs> it's beautiful. Wow. Hobbit art. Oh, they're running in fear. Great. We love to see it. <laughs> this is an $18 card at present and a very expensive one to be reprinted into a commander deck. I am delighted. Yeah, great to see it. Makes sense to put the board wipe yep. that makes you pay life in the deck that's going to gain a ton of life. Ton great of place life. to put it. Yep. Uh, a little strange because, you know, a lot of these decks are full of little guys, so it will sort of hit you the hardest, but mm -hmm. happy to see it all we the same. Yes. Next one is Birds of Paradise, still clocking in at $8.50, despite its reprint in Dominaria Remastered. Uh, I'm so excited to see a couple of reprints of this card and trying to keep it in a place where it's not annoying to buy. Yeah, just a 
Great ramp card. Yep. You almost always want it if your deck is at least three colors and one of them is green. Also, it's pretty. It's very pretty. Yeah. All of the art, in addition to being unique, is just beautiful it is really in this cool. deck. All right. What's the next one? Uh, the next one, we have Anguished Unmaking coming in at $8, which took me by surprise. Still so high. Still so high after its relatively recent feeling uh, Double Masters 2022 reprint. There was like a misprint where they printed too many Anguish on Makings and it is still an $8 card. So uh, nice it to see it. It must be good. A uh, good removal spell covers your bases, um, which is nice. A nice flexible removal spell for a commander. Yeah. Uh, Up next, we have the best card in Magic, according to Josh Lee Kwai. He loves this one. It's Chromatic Lantern, which Currently is still going. <laughs> above $5. <laughs> he cannot influence the price of this card. We will have to keep mentioning it every time every they put time. it in a pre-con, which they will keep doing. It is $5.50 at present. This is the prettiest one, in my opinion. It's got some cute little hobbits around a lantern. Oh, yeah, that's great. It's beautiful. Um, and it is $5.50, despite it being a three-mana three, uh, mana rock. Uh, one more card above $5. Yeah, it's Essence Warden coming in at five fifty. Nice. A card that didn't necessarily surprise me that it was this expensive. I, you know, I feel like I sort of vaguely remembered that there is a scarcity element to it. Yeah, this one's been reprinted the least. So it's nice to see a new version of it uh, with some new art on it, too, which is, I think this is the first printing. It's the second art of Essence, Essence Warden. I think that's right. And yeah, no, it's just a, in the kind of decks that want sort of a Soul Sisters type effect, it's great to, and if, if you're in green, it's great to have that more accessible. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there are nine cards between $2 and $5. Many of them are lands. I'm going to go through them pretty quick here. Uh, we're excited to see all of these lands. They represent some real lands, which is great. Uh, Sun Petal Grove is $4.75. Mm-hmm. Sanguine Bond, uh, which is not a land. But not a land. Is, yeah, is a $4.50 enchantment right now and is getting a reprint. But now we're back to lands. But now we're back to lands. Brush Land, which is coming in at $4.50. Scattered Grove, which is uh, $4.50. Farseek, which is all the way up to $4. $4. It gets a land. Yeah. That's good. Still lands. Uh, Isolated Chapel is $4. Woodland Cemetery, $3.50. Path to Exile, still breaking the $2 uh, limit here at three dollars and soul ring forever above two dollars it is two dollars and 25 cents for uh one with sauron on it we'll take it yeah really beautiful art on all of these reprints especially that soul ring is just great it's so cool it's so cool i uh am obsessed with these decks i'm buying a set for sure all right uh so what let's talk about just the best cards in this deck these are the cards that when they're in your hand you're like i am gonna do it i i am operating at full speed yes and uh i will say both of these are very much uh the best cards given that you are running mary and pippin right they are not necessarily the best cards for any commander out of the Mm -hmm. box they are specifically good yeah uh the first of which is farmer cotton (laughs) (laughs) farmer cotton costs x a green and a white uh legendary creature halfling peasant when farmer cotton enters the battlefield create x one one white halfling creature tokens and x food tokens and he himself is a little one one that's such a good rate it's It's a very good rate and two mana and x to make twice that many tokens yeah It's very powerful. Anything that cares about tokens in general loves to see this card. Mm. And just Pippin loves to see this card. It makes you the board that you want to grow, and it, in theory, makes you all of the food that you need to grow it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it only uh, triggers Mary once, because it's whenever one or more artifacts enter, but... It's always once with Mary, so that's <laughs> that's how it's going to be. Yeah, because yeah. Pippin gives haste with the anthem, too. Oh, my gosh. If you have Pippin out and you play this, uh, you can sacrifice you of four mana. of the food that you made and then slam it, and they're all four fours with haste. Yeah, if you ramped a ton, that could be your game winning turn right there. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. Uh, the other best card I picked is Motivated Pony. It's a pony. It's a pony with enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, it costs five mana, four and a green for a three, three horse, of course. It has trample and haste. And whenever Motivated Pony attacks, 
Attacking creatures get plus one plus one until end of turn. But if a food entered the battlefield under your control this turn, untap those creatures and they get an additional plus two plus two until end of turn. Mm -hmm. It is effectively redundancy with Pippin's second ability, which is a big thing you want. Uh, It gives the whole team plus three plus three and untap on attack if you manage to make the food. So if you tap Pippin to make a food token, for example, and then you cast Motivated Pony, you can attack that turn. It has haste. It will untap Pippin and give him power. Is that correct? No, it's attacking creatures. It doesn't untap Pippin. It doesn't. Shh. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It untaps it's everything the, else. So it gives it them like vigilance else. and plus three plus three and trample, right? Yeah. And honestly, I would probably slate this here even without the untap. I right. just think that having the ability to use the anthem by surprise, because I think a lot of the time your opponents are going to be very aware, do you have four food tokens or not? For sure. And this basically is just a card that says, it doesn't matter if you have four food tokens. If you made even Mm -hmm. one, your go wide overrun effect uh, is online. Uh, And for those who are listening at home on the podcast, the reason the pony is so motivated is because there's a carrot being dangled in front of his mouth, which is... The food token. He's mm-hmm. motivated by the food. It's so good. <laughs> it's very flavorful. <laughs> All right. We are going to get into the upgrade right after this. Uh, we are doing a $50 upgrade for today's uh to today's pre-con upgrade so stick around but first we are going to have a word from our sponsors hey everyone we are super excited to announce that we are now sponsored by architect architect is the perfect place to build and store decks online whether you want to build from scratch or catalog your collection everything is easy and intuitive it's got the same feeling as when you sit at the table with your cards laid out right in front of you then once your deck is done and ready to go their built-in play tester is a great tool to make sure your brews work as intended and now that architect has partnered with edh rec they have all the resources and data they need to really refine and perfect the platform. So even if you've tried Architect in the past, it's definitely worth taking a new look right now. Just go to architect.com and start brewing on the best deck builder out there. That's A R C H I D E K T.com. <laughs> the Eldrazia Ravaging Zendikar! Chandra, Flame Caller, call forth your flames! No can do, Gideon. But the Eldrazi! I called my flames three times this month, and my phone bill is crazy high. Plus, inflation's burning through my bank account, so... My Pyro Paizan, you must switch to Mint Mobile. They offer premium wireless service for only 15 bucks a month. Whoa, are they having a fire sale? Not at all, my incandescent comrade. By going online only, Mint Mobile eliminates the cost of retail and passes the savings on to us. With unlimited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network. I call my allies every day to let them know I'm still alive. And you got to keep your number and contacts? Correct, my fiery friend. Wow. In that case, I'll call my flames right now. Oh, hey, flames. Yeah, can you toast this noodly fool? Thanks. To get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash command. That's mintmobile.com slash command. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash command. Uh, okay, my turn. What is it, turn 20? Uh, oh, okay, don't worry. I think I can finally win. Even after this cyclonic rift? What? (laughs) What? I'm still feeling good. Thanks to Liquid IV, I'm always ready for the long game. Liquid IV is the number one powdered hydration brand in America. And it's not just for diehard athletes and marathon runners. Even if you're just going to work for the day or spending a game night with friends, proper hydration is essential. One stick of Liquid IV hydrates you two times faster than water alone. Plus, you get essential vitamins and great flavors like pina colada or strawberry. Best of all, Liquid IV is helping communities in need. They've donated over 39 million servings in 50 plus countries around the world. Hey, this is good. I think I could go a couple more turns. Yeah, we're all gonna mill out soon anyway. Ooh, even after this time twister. Oh, oh come, come on. on. Seriously? <laughs> My deck has no win cards. <laughs> real people, real flavor, real hydrating. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code COMMAND at checkout. That's 20% off anything when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code COMMAND at liquidiv.com. 
Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. We are going to go to our upgrade guide for this pre-con. We are going to add 10 cards to make it in tip-top fighting shape. We're going to take 10 cards out because that's how Commander works. And this time we used a spendy budget because these cards, like these pre-cons are exciting and you're already invested in them. We want to make sure that you can play them at their very, very best. And we want to play around with these pre-cons, make sure that we are serving you guys the best uh, the best budget guides that work for you. So uh, we're trying something new. We tried $10, we're trying 50 and we'll see where we land. Uh, but it felt like Lord of the Rings was the time that we could really invest. Uh, but before we get into that, let's just talk about this deck as it lies. The, the this uh, hundred cards. What do you what do you think? What were you trying to do when you got into upgrading this? Uh, I think that the deck out of the box, and we've talked about this, mm. is sort of split a bit, trying to have enough support for whatever commander you choose. Mm -hmm. But a uh, piece that supports one commander may not support the others. Right. So a big part of the plan is just really focus it around mm -hmm. Merry and Pippin, which are not the face commanders and thus probably have sort of the second most support of right. the three options that you can put in the command zone. Uh, and then beyond that, just try to make it fast and explosive. Mm. There are some cards that I would describe as more on the big clunky side that are in it out of the box. Let's get all that super high mana curve stuff out of there, mm -hmm. throw in some quick and aggressive things to really get the game plan going fast and try to make this a deck that doesn't end the game so fast that it's unfun, right. but something that can really sort of keep up at a table where things are moving a little more quickly. Right, and you don't have these high CMC stuff like gunking up your hand as yeah. much, can get things moving. Cool. Well, let's not delay anymore. We're going to get into this budget upgrade, starting with the 10 cards that we are going to add. Uh, again, we had a hefty budget this time. We're doing $50, so you can really invest in this deck and make it uh, in tip-top shape. Uh, all right, so what is the first card that we added? Uh, the first card going in is White Plume Adventurer. Ah, it's so good. It's two and a white for a 3-3 three, three Orc Cleric. I don't think I realized Orc Cleric before, but I love that. <laughs> uh, when it enters the battlefield, you take the initiative. Uh, I know. Uh, it's good. It's good. The, it's very relevant, even in the first room. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, untap a creature you control. If you've completed a dungeon, untap all creatures you control instead. Yes, exactly. Untap a Pippin. Untap target Pippin every turn. Uh, so this means that you can make a food every turn, as long as you have one mana available to you, which triggers Mary every turn. Yeah. You're making soldier, soldier, soldier. I love it. Yeah. If you have those three out, you can just even... Uh, Draw go and mm -hmm. know that you are going to, in one turn rotation, have enough stuff to activate Pippin on your next turn if you want. Right. Which is so scary, actually. Yeah. Um, and that card is only $3.50, despite its <laughs> brief <laughs> excursion into legacy. It had a moment in the sun. <laughs> and now it's back in the dungeon. And now it's back in Commander. We'll take it. $3.50 for White Plume Adventurer. Uh, what is our next card? Uh, up next, we have Academy Manufacturer. Oh, a classic. Yeah. Three mana artifact creature, assembly worker. It's a 1-3. And if you would create a clue, food, or treasure token, instead create one of each. This Deck go, this card goes in any deck that is making any one of those kinds of tokens. Yeah. Only $2 for Academy Manufacturer still. Yeah, they know it's good. They're reprinting it. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you, guys. What's the next one? Up next, we have Guillaume Master Chef. The best. We love him. <laughs> uh, he is four mana, two and a Golgari for a legendary creature, Troll Warlock. Mm -hmm. He's a 5-3 with Trample. At the beginning of your end step, create a number of food tokens equal to the number of non-token creatures you had enter the battlefield under your control this turn. And there's more. Pay, you can pay one and sacrifice a food to make a creature indestructible until end of turn and tap it because it has to enjoy that food. Yeah, he had a hearty meal. He's time for a nap. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> This seems great. I yeah. mean, you want a lot of food tokens. You want to get to the four food quickly. That is, I think, one of the things that is most likely to be an obstacle in the deck out of the box is just hitting yeah. that food count. He's also a 5-3 with trample. So giving him plus three, plus three, it turns this thing into a house. An 8-6 yeah. is like, uh... And even if it slows down 
the overrun clock, I would mm. still gladly sacrifice a food to protect one of my commanders yeah. and at least keep them on the battlefield. Yeah. And the, so, yeah, that indestructible giving ability, the ability to protect your own board or use it to tap down your opponent's board when you are ready to do the big overrun turn, mm -hmm. if you have enough food to do both. Uh, totally all options are great. Yeah. Yeah. Guillaume. I, Guillaume is so strong. And I, I think people do, like, they remember the indestructible clause and forget the tapping clause. And you're like, I have enough blockers. You don't. You don't have enough blockers for Guillaume. No. Uh, so a great ad and uh, does a lot of work here. Like, interaction plus food plus you know, protect board protection. Yeah, it's everything you want yeah. for a dollar. A dollar? He's so good. Uh, up next, we have some cards that are not a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had a $50 budget. Let's spend it. Uh, the first of the two is Chatterfang Squirrel General. <laughs> <laughs> a three mana, three, three legendary squirrel warrior with Forest Walk. And if one or more tokens would be created under your control, those tokens plus that many 1-1 one, one green squirrel creature tokens are created instead. Mm -hmm. And also, you can pay one black mana and sacrifice X squirrels to give target creature plus X minus X until end of turn. Ugh. So Chatterfang makes squirrels when you make foods. It makes squirrels when you make soldiers. It yeah. makes squirrels when you make also your clues and your treasures. Uh, yeah, it seems crazy in this deck. It's great. Yeah, if you have both <laughs> your commanders out and Chatterfang and you activate your commander, you end up with one food, one soldier, and two squirrels for one minute. <laughs> I love the idea that the uh, the Shire is being overrun by squirrels. Yeah, I also feel like the food being the thing that brings a squirrel with it is pretty, flavorful. Uh, pretty good. <laughs> I feel like if you ask me what I imagine a squirrel doing at any given moment, it's eating. Yeah, uh-huh. And removing other creatures, apparently. Yes, gnawing uh, them to death. Oh, God. <laughs> when you run out of food, that's what there is. All right, this next one is spendy, but fits in our budget. Yes, the next one is Mondrek, Glory Dominus. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, white Dominus from All Will Be One. Uh, it's four mana for a 4-4 four, four legendary creature, a Phyrexian horror. Uh, <laughs> if one or more tokens would be created under your control, uh, create twice that many of those tokens instead. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can pay one and two Phyrexian white mana and sacrifice two other artifacts and or creatures to put an indestructible counter on it so good it's very good i mean token doubling is just it's always one of the most powerful things you can do in a token mm -hmm. deck it's also one of the most expensive financially things you can do in a token yes. deck this card is coming in at 28 dollars. if you want this budget upgrade guide to be 25 dollars, just don't put this card in yeah and we're there there you go <laughs> see <laughs> I, yeah, I, Mondrak really does raise the floor of this deck a lot. It, 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 like you said, when you're doing the upgrade, you want the deck to be more explosive, especially if there's a board wipe. You can Mondrak allows you to rebuild quickly. Uh, is really what these token doublers are great for. Yeah, and this deck is so good at just putting out tokens early. Mm -hmm. Just you know, don't play this card and then leave no mana up. Leave at least the one up. You will have the food tokens or creature tokens to put an indestructible right. counter on it. It will be able to protect itself right away the turn you play it. Yeah, it's uh, it, it definitely playing Mondrak and passing is not a great idea. Holding mana up so you can activate Pippin and make those. So like if you do turn two, Pippin, turn three, Mary, turn four, ramp, activate Pippin, turn five, Mondrak, then you've got enough mana to both activate Pippin and sack some stuff to make your Mondrak indestructible. Yeah, it's good with so much in the deck and just sort of, I'll get into this a bit later in the thing, mm. but as far as the big effect, you can either go for increasing tokens or untapping Pippin. Mm -hmm. And we've now seen both of those. Yeah. Uh, but the reason that I sort of went with a sort of big financial splurge on something that doubles tokens is there are so many things that make tokens mm -hmm. in this deck. Pippin is kind of the only thing that you care about untapping. So right. it just kind of made sense if you're yeah. pulled in those two directions on what to really invest in. I recommend the token strategy, at least if you're upgrading out of the box. Mm -hmm. But I do think an untappy build from scratch would be very cool. fun. Yeah. Uh, this next one is a classic in any token build, and it's only a dollar and fifty cents. It's Idol of Oblivion. Oh, this card's so good. A two mana artifact that says tap, draw a card, activate only if you've created a token this turn. 
you will have. Yeah. Or you can pay eight, tap it, and sacrifice it to create a 10-10 colorless Eldrazi creature token. You won't have. Yes. Don't <laughs> do that. You almost certainly won't do that. Unless it, that 10-10 wins you the game, keep your card draw around. But yeah, just a two-mana way to draw a card every turn cycle. Mm. Just very useful, especially yep. when we are not running the commanders that would have card draw in the command zone. Right. It bolsters that card draw number a little bit. Yeah. Uh, as does this next one. Yeah, the next one is Shamanic Revelation, which Still is just, good. yeah, it's a great card draw piece when you're going wide, which this deck wants to do. It's a uh, three green green, uh, so five mana total for a sorcery. You draw a card for each creature you control, and you gain four life for each of those creatures with power four or greater. So in that dream scenario mm, where you Bilbo, have... Bilbo, <laughs> we're coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> not what I had, not where I thought you were going with that when you started reaching. Really thought you were going to reach for Pippin to mm. point out that if you anthem, you can gain a lot of life. That too. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I, we're going to celebrate this, this 11th first birthday here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Shamanic Revelation is only $1. Yeah. Hopefully you're drawing a lot of cards for that buck. Yeah. Yeah, that's like, you know, like 20 cents a card. Yeah. 10 cents a card. You're I a token deck. Five cents a card. Pretty good. If I could pay five cents in a game of Commander to draw a card, I would. I would have a lot less money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Games with Josh would get real weird. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> now I want a, a, like a Commander variant where you can pay money to get effects. Oh, yeah. And then if you win, you win the pot. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's wild <laughs> i'm having a good time oh yeah uh, <laughs> all right um this next one is good in any token deck especially a deck with some of these big x spells like we said farmer cotton um yeah yeah uh, we've got jahira friend of the forest mm -hmm. uh two and a green for a two three legendary human elf druid tokens you control not just creature tokens have tap to add a green mana mm -hmm. that's great it's Your food so tokens good. and the soldier tokens you get from Mary both are mana producers. Especially in this build, you're not as inclined to sacrifice these food tokens. So tapping them, it makes them into just free moxes. Uh, While well, you're paying one for them with Pippin. But that's so powerful. Yeah, that's a very good take. Is You know, a lot of the time before you have four food, they are just sitting there. They are not advancing your board right. state. They are just working towards your threat of activation. Right. Uh, so yeah, giving them an ability... Uh, that makes them more than just a future problem. Really, really good. Yeah. Uh, a present also, problem. you can tap them for mana and then sacrifice them to Pippin. Uh, if you can give your foods haste. Ooh. ooh. <laughs> I, I wanted there to be more <laughs> ways to give your food abilities when I was looking at Frodo and Sam because yeah. Sam makes your food's abilities cost one less. Right. They were not... Some super compelling ways to take advantage of that. <laughs> uh, but Jahira is coming in at just 250 Yeah, the great include in a deck like this. This next one is only 50 cents and is terrifying. Yeah. Uh, the next two are both variations on a theme. Mm -hmm. But the first of these two is Inspiring Leader. It is a background from Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate. Uh, it is two and a white for a legendary enchantment background that says commander creatures you own have creature tokens you control get plus two plus two. But hold on, Rachel. I have two commanders. It sure does work that <laughs> way, doesn't it? So this, if you control both Pippin and Mary, your creature tokens get plus four plus four. Just statically all the time. Outrageous uh, for a three mana anthem. Uh, Inspiring Leader is extremely powerful and only a 50 cent card. Uh, if you're playing tokens and you want your commander in play, it, this is the kind of card that I'm putting in every deck. Yeah, exactly. I, I would gladly run this in a token deck that mm -hmm. uh, does not have two commanders. So yeah. the fact that you're getting double the effect is just, like you said, a hugely powerful impact on the board. Yeah. Let's uh, do it again. Yes. Uh, the final card being added is Agent of the Iron Throne. Uh, it is two and a black for a legendary enchantment background, and it says commander creatures you own have, whenever an artifact or creature you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent loses one life. Pretty good when you have two commanders. Yeah. Pretty good when you have one commander. <laughs> I know, yeah. It's a great aristocrats piece in general. And this deck isn't that. There are perhaps zero sack outlets for creatures mm -hmm. in the deck. 
but there are food which yep. sacrifice themselves innately. And just if you have both commanders out and you activate Pippin's overrun ability, sacking four foods, that's eight life loss around the table out of the gate before you even get to combat. Right. Because each of them is triggering uh, once off of each of the mm. foods. So two times four. Yeah, this... Uh this kind of effect, I think, is still good even when you're not building explicitly aristocrat strategies because you are still trying to win with damage. So if you can chip away at their life total in any way, it just makes this overrun that much better and that much scarier. Uh, plus, when you're trying to attack with tokens, this means like if you block them, you're taking damage. And if you don't block them, you're taking damage, uh, which puts you know your opponents in a lose-lose situation that's very powerful in Commander. Yeah, it's got kind of that... um. The Elish Norn that's just called Elish Norn effect on the game, where right. it's a real uh, <laughs> you lose life if you do, you lose life if you don't situation. So you might as well. All right. Well, that is our 10 cards that we are adding into the deck coming under the budget at $47. Again, if you're like, you know what? I think $25 works better for me. That's totally cool. Don't buy Mondrak. Uh, the rest of these will come in. What does that mean? Like 19 bucks without Mondrak? Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, so you can you can have this budget any way you like it. Uh, we did include a couple of splurge cards. If you really want to upgrade the deck as much as possible and you're willing to spend a little bit more uh, and you're like, you know what? I have a Mondrak. I don't want to spend the $28 there. Spend it here on these splurge cards. Exactly. Uh, the first of these two is Seedborn Muse coming in at $17. We talked about the untapped strategy. Uh, It's three green green for a two four uh, that says untap all permanents you control during each other player's untap step. Mm -hmm. All permanents, big deal. Uh, You aren't just getting Pippin, you are getting your lands. So you always have that one mana. Yep, you can hold up your anguish from making. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) You can hold up your $8 anguish to make it. But also, yeah, your commander has activated abilities. So you can activate Pippin every turn, trigger Mary every turn, uh, hold up all your mana for instance. In case something terrible happens, you could crack a ton of food. Seedborn Muse just opens your options. It's great. It was right on the cusp of sort of swapping in for the slot Mondrak was in. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it synergizes with less of the deck than Mondrak did. Uh, the other card, you love to hate it, it's Smothering Tithe. Sure is Currently good, isn't at $33. it? $33. Yeah, hopefully we'll get a reprint soon, but 33 bucks for the Smothering Tithe. Yep, your opponents almost certainly aren't paying, they rarely do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that means that on every turn of the rotation, you will be having an artifact enter the battlefield under your control, which means that without even needing to make food, Mary will be triggering and making you a 1-1 one, one life-thinking soldier every turn. Pretty good. So you will, be, you will have no problem going wider than everyone at the table can block. Pretty good. I like that a lot. All right, uh, we're at it. We've added 10 cool cards to the deck, which means we have to take 10 out, the hardest thing <laughs> to do in mm-hmm. any commander deck. Uh, but this one, because we're just focusing it a little bit, I imagine the cuts were a little bit easier. Yeah, the cuts were a little easier. Uh, and some of the cards, especially just from a mana curve perspective, mm-hmm. kind of uh, put themselves forward right. as cuts to make. Mm-hmm. That said, the first of these cuts is not one of those. It's just a card that I don't think is great. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's Shire Sheriff, which is from the main set of Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle Earth. Uh, it's a two mana, two, two halfling soldier with vigilance. When it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a token. When you do, exile target creature and opponent controls until Shire Sheriff leaves the battlefield. It's removal, but only sometimes, and it's removal that is in the type that is easiest to remove itself, and then they get back whatever you took. Yeah, and you have to sacrifice something to do it that it it feels it feels really tough to make work. It's like it temporarily gets rid of something, but yeah, this deck the tokens that this deck is making are not expendable to things other than the deck's game plan. You right. want to be keeping them for your win condition. You don't want to be throwing them away on removal that is then maybe mm-hmm. going to get undone regardless. Yeah. Uh, this next one falls under that j- too high on the curve. Uh, it does. Uh, the next one is Orchard Strider, which is six mana for a tree folk. It's a six, four. When it enters the battlefield, create two food tokens, relevant and basic land cycling for one in a green relevant, mm-hmm. but it's six mana for not 
six mana in commander's worth right. of effect. Six mana for two foods, or you know, you draw one of your thirty-eight lands. It it feels like you're not going to have a ton of tr- trouble hitting your land drops without uh, having a cycler. Exactly, and I'm actually going to speed through the next two cuts mm-hmm. on this list because they're sort of all variations on the theme. Right. We have Eagles in the North uh, again from the main set, a six mana three three flyer with a land cycling ability and a little anthem effect when it ETBs. Mm-hmm. And we have Generous Ent, a six mana five seven with Reach that uh, makes a food when it ETBs and has a forest cycling ability. Right. And all of these are just they're all six mana. They all land cycle. And they all have an ETB that is fine. Right. But just for six mana in a deck that ought not be hurting to draw lands, it's not ramp to land cycle. You just pull them out of the deck. Mm -hmm. None of these feel like they are just kind of strong enough to stay in a deck after it's been upgraded. I also like land cycling uh, when I'm not doing anything on turn two or turn three. And your commanders are turn two and turn three. Yeah. And a couple of them have land cycling for one. There is a chance... But you having those in the deck, first. sometimes it will yeah. turn something that wouldn't otherwise be a good opener into a good opener. But, but just with how low the d- curve of the deck is anyway, yeah. you shouldn't need to be doing that. Right, yeah. Makes uh, sense. Up next, we have Hithlane Rope, which I hope I'm saying right. And if I'm not, tell me. Uh, this card is new from this deck. Uh, It is a two-mana artifact that says Hithlane Rope can't be sacrificed. You can pay one and tap it to tutor a basic onto the battlefield tapped, then pass this card to your right, or two and tap it to draw a card, then pass this card to your right. The less fun direction to pass it, because it takes so long for it to get around back to you. Doesn't one go right and one go left? No. They both go right? They both go right. Weird. So you pass it to the player who's going last. Yeah. Very slow. Okay. Yeah. I I somewhat understand the thinking of they don't want the game to just become every single turn of the game someone is activating the same card. Right. But it does make the card significantly less fun. Right. Yeah. That's uh, that's a shame. I thought that you could like choose who to give it to, but it, it becomes less of a mini game. Yeah, no, it's just kind of. It feels like a cute group hug card that is just just not at the power level yep. of a of a post upgrade deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next card we have is Crypt Incursion. Uh, this is two in a black for an instant that says exile all creatures from target player's graveyard. You gain three life for each card exiled this way. This, Probably not a don't need to spend a whole card on this kind of graveyard hate. Don't need to spend a whole card. Certainly not a three mana card on this. Uh, especially because we are not we are playing the one commander option that does not care whether you're gaining life or not. Right. Mm-hmm. That seems fair. Yep. Uh this card I'm ashamed to be cutting, but I stand by it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Field Tested Frying Pan, another new card from this deck, two and a white for an equipment. Uh, When it enters the battlefield, you create a food token and a halfling token, and then attach the frying pan to the halfling token. And equipped creature has, whenever you gain life, equipped creature gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the amount of life you gained, and it has equipped two. And again, these are just this is the commando duo that is not necessarily going to be gaining life. The mm-hmm. only way that it really is going to is because the tokens you make have lifelink, but by the time that life is being gained, it is too late for the power right. and toughness boost from the frying pan to matter. For sure. It's cute. It does add a food and a token to the mm-hmm. board. I would say this one is on the fence if you are if you are looking to deviate from my cuts, this is the one that is probably the most worth keeping in. Mm-hmm. But I just don't quite think it makes the cut. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, up next, Butterbur Bree Innkeeper, mm-hmm. another main set card. Yep. Uh, two green white, so four total for a 3 3 human peasant. At the beginning of your end step, if you don't control a food, create a food. Boy, do you never not control a food. You should never not control a food. Yeah. I understand this maybe in the Sam build where you are making and sacrificing a food immediately. Right, yeah. But even then, it's kind of iffy on that. You're just, it's a food deck. You're going to control a food. Right. Having your food maker only work if you've run out does not feel yep. I, great. Uh, for sure. <laughs> uh, we have Landreval Horizon Witness, another main set card. Uh, 
Four and a white for a 3-4 flying. Whenever two or more creatures you control attack a player, target attacking creature without flying gains flying until end of turn. Yeah. I just don't think it quite does enough for... It's five mana. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it gives... Low. Yeah, it gives one creature evasion. Which in a go wide token deck, evasion is not really that important. You're going around. Yeah, making one of your four fours, assuming they are attacking as four fours, harder to block, should not be relevant. Right. And not what you want to spend five mana to do. Mm-hmm. And then the last cut, you hate to don't, see him go. Don't. And you can't watch him walk away because he turned invisible he... when he put the ring on. <laughs> <laughs> it's Bilbo birthday celebrant. We've talked Celebrate about Celebrate your birthdays <laughs> somewhere else. He made a birthday escape Bilbo. right on out of this deck. Yeah. <laughs> We are not going to get to 111 life in this deck, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And even, you know, turning all your uh, one ones with lifelink into gaining two life whenever they hit, you just don't care. Yeah. You should be fine. Uh, I don't feel like this is a deck that is necessarily going to struggle with defense because mm-hmm. before your big attack, you will be gumming up the board with a lot of little one ones with mm-hmm. lifelink. Uh, yeah, I just don't think any of Bilbo's abilities are actually going to be relevant in this deck, unless you count his charming art as one of his <laughs> abilities. Very, that counts. <laughs> also, you're playing Marion Pippin, you know, like, they don't care about Bilbo. Bilbo's yeah. some old guy who ran away. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, th- those makes make sense to me. I think that'll really clean up your curve and get some real power in there in uh, your ads. So how does the deck play? Like, what does it look like post, uh, post upgrade? Uh, I think the game plan is you really want the commanders out quickly, and that is easy yep. to do because they cost two and three respectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if sort of each turn after that, you are playing something that really synergizes with one or both of the commanders and having that one mana up right. to create a food, mm-hmm. which you know you don't have to do until the end step before right. your next turn. So you can hold it up to bluff whatever you would like. Uh, yeah. That's kind of the game plan. Just keep deploying synergy pieces, keep going wide with food and creature tokens until you hit that threshold of four foods. Uh, and then I really think the game plan is use that overrun ability, win through combat, slam it. Maybe get sneaky overrun ability with motivated pony or yeah. something uh, of its ilk. I I think that commander players are also tempted to hold this activated ability until they have lethal. And I think because it's on your commander and because you don't sacrifice your commander to do it, you sacrifice four foods. Like. If you have it and you have a board and you're going to do relevant damage, do it. Yeah, go for it. The one uh, ones that you'll have through Mary have lifelink. You yeah. do not need to worry about the crackback. You are going to be gaining a ton of life. Right. If you if you have the attack, take it and work on building up more foods for the next time. But uh, this is definitely the kind of deck that can overcommit to the board and miss an opportunity because they were playing too defensively. Yeah. It is really not unfeasible to imagine activating Pippin, overrun, big attack, and just through the cards that you can play, Mm -hmm. being able to do that again the next turn. You know, if you do that and then you farmer cotton the next turn where X is at least four, surprise, it happened again right away. Yeah. Just try to activate that ability early and often. Yeah, if you can do it, do it. Uh, Don't wait until somebody finds their board wipe because they're looking for it, I promise. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, this deck looks sweet. I uh, I'm really happy with the with the upgrade, and it's it's really cool to see something that feels halflingy, that feels feisty. Yeah, I, I think that it it just has a really good vibe. It does. <laughs> <laughs> this deck has great vibes. I suppose it's, I would say like it's we didn't get to talk about all of the cards in here, but there's a ton of new cards that are funny and like intriguing mechanically and encourage you to do something kind of weird. There's a card called, card called prize pig. It's awesome. It's, it's like very powerful. Good. Maybe not with these commanders as much, but it is a quite good it's card if good. you're gaining life. It's like, I, I just think this deck has a lot of, a lot of spirit and it's a, it has a lot of like punching power as well. Like banquet guests, I think is like an real problem. It's yeah. such a, there's a lot of like very goofball cards that can hit really hard. And I think it's gonna, um, I hope it's popular because I, I think it has a lot of, 
a lot of uh, good, good vibes. Yeah, yeah. it's You're weird right. to have the threatening cards be named things like prized pig and banquet guest. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice for those to be the things that are instilling fear and in your motivated opponents. motivated pony. <laughs> like, that is one motivated yeah. pony. And it's so fun in decks like this, and it was sort of the same with Warhammer, mm-hmm. where they even do new art for the reprints. Yeah. It is so fun to add cards that do not fit that to it. Just be like, here is a deck that is entirely sort of taking place in the Shire and yeah. the story of Middle-earth. And here's Mondra. Mondra! <laughs> Glory Dominus! <laughs> Screaming uh, Phyrexian sounds over the horizon of the Shire. <laughs> And the hobbits are overjoyed about it. <laughs> They're, They're still like, yes, eating. This more is my food. ally. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, this is our friend, <laughs> Screaming Millennium Falcon. Uh, uh, this one's sweet. Uh, to the listeners, what do you think of the Food and Fellowship precon? Are you as high on it as we are? Any cards that we missed? Any su- su- suggestions to take out uh, or add that you disagree with? That you're like. Mm, I think this one's better. Uh, tell us what you think about the new $50 budget. Again, we're trying stuff. We want stuff to appeal to you and be useful to you. So uh, we're experimenting with a bunch of different values and uh, hope the $50 budget was fun for y'all. Uh, if you saw any cards that you like and you're like, I again need to get myself a prize pig, uh, go to cardkingdom.com slash command, which now has prize pig for sale. Uh, they're becoming a real food market over there. They got a gilded goose. They're selling an innkeeper. You can get a bunch of weird stuff at Card Kingdom. Uh, Plus, they have a huge variety of cards. If you're building a flavorful Hobbit deck and you're like, I can't bring myself to put Mondrek in it because it's too terrifying. I get it. Uh, Go to Card Kingdom and see what else they have available. Or maybe you do the black and white art so it's at least obscured (laughs) what it is. (laughs) I well, that's the thing I love about Universes Beyond is it does create this board state where you're like and Ratchet the Transformer is now recurring the Lembus bread from the graveyard. Wait, that's really good. Uh, it's it Lembus shuffles. I'm furious. Oh no! I know. Wait, uh, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, you have to do it like in response to a trigger. I've been working on it. Trust me, mm. I've been on Card Kingdom looking at cards, trying to mash together some very silly Universes Beyond and support the show by going to CardKingdom.com command that helps us out a whole lot uh you can also help the show by going to ultrapro.com slash command i imagine that they're going to have a whole bunch of very exciting lord of the rings stuff available play mats and sleeves and binders maybe dice i don't know i don't know it could be anything uh lord of the rings is a super big set so ultra pro tends to to really show up for that and offer a ton of merch so if you're excited about lord of the rings you love lord of the rings go check out their website sign up for their newsletter make sure that you know when new products products are coming out or when new stuff is going on sale and you can support the command zone while you're doing so uh, again go to ultrapro.com slash command to support the show and get some cool stuff all right we've talked about magic what are you what are you doing outside of magic right now uh well what i'm doing is playing tears of the kingdom yeah, but yeah, what i'm doing <laughs> in the uh but that's, I'm doing... every, that's gonna be everybody's end step for every single budget I'm creating. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, but what I'm doing for about thirty to forty minutes uh, yeah. a week when I'm not playing Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah. Uh, I'm watching the third season of the show that I really like and I'm really trying to get more people to watch, including mm. you now, uh, called The Other Two. Yeah. Which is um, the basic premise for the first season when it begins. Uh huh is there is this family of a mom and three children, and the youngest child gets Justin Bieber famous. He is about (laughs) 13, and he makes a music video that goes viral on YouTube, and they play it very much. They know what they're doing. It's a very cheeky tone of show. He effectively is Justin Bieber, and it's about his two siblings, the other two, who had been trying to make it as an actor or a dancer, and sort of how they cope with the fact that their significantly younger brother... Uh, is now the one of the family that became famous. And it takes a lot of turns from there. But just the tone of the show, it's like if Bravo and E <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sort of had a baby with Comedy Central, which right. is where it used to air on Comedy Central. Now it is uh, an HBO Max show, which by the time this comes out will just be called Max. Just Max. Just Max. Not HBO anymore. Starting May 23rd, HBO Max, Max is Max. <laughs> <laughs> I keep getting that reminder, too. <laughs> just so you know, uh, I'm going by Max now. Uh, I'm dropping HBO. It's uh, it's just cleaner. <laughs> or <Yep>. something. <laughs> 
But, cool. Okay. Yeah, it's just fantastically fun. Yeah. It's you know I think that uh, it's just not the most common thing in the world to find a sitcom that is consistently very funny, mm-hmm. and this is that. Yeah. I, I think great. that it also just would appeal to a wide audience, even if sort of the idea of something that feels like it's in that Bravo Hollywood space does not seem like something you would innately go for. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel at least it has jokes for all audiences. I am not a Bravo or E viewer, mm. but uh, I just find it really funny. It's written by um, some SNL veterans, including a former SNL head writer. Cool. That sounds great. Uh, go check that out on Max. Don't search HBO. You won't find it. They're going to take it all down. They're going <laughs> to. Any oh. website that says HBO Max Who will knows? be changed. Also, uh, the writers have been striking and they just keep striking. So you're going to need some good TV to watch. Uh, we're going to say thank you before we go to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Thank you to Craig Lanchette, Damon Lentz, Arthur Metacroft, Lady Danger, Manson, Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Garav Galati, Mitch Trafford, Evan Limberger, Gabriel Pozos, Megan Yep, Eric Lem, Josh Lee Quiet, and Jimmy wong thanks for listening everybody we got some uh a lot more upgrades and a lot of lord of the rings content coming your way so thanks for listening and thanks jamie for taking the time thanks oh, for the doing a sweet pleasure. upgrade thank you Bye. And thank you For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> Don't cut this. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep going. Keep going. It's Damn not it. over. <laughs> Especially from the audio version. <laughs> We're still waving. <laughs>